This episode is brought to you by Sabio, the number one coding bootcamp for veterans. Visit sabio.la slash military to learn more. Before we begin, a quick correction. In this episode, Seth refers to Daniel Gould being a third group member. He was assigned to seventh group at the time of his arrest. We're back for part two of our interview with Army veteran turned investigative journalist Seth Harp to finish our conversation about controversies at Fort Bragg. This time, we'll get into the fentanyl epidemic that has been wreaking havoc at Fort Bragg and talk about a huge news story out of 3rd Special Forces Group regarding an investigation into drug and human trafficking. Let's get back to Seth to hear about how fentanyl has impacted soldiers at Fort Bragg. We get into the uh, the drugs that are uh, going around uh, Fort Bragg and you know we've kind of talked about the distribution I feel like what is the impact of all of this um you know cocaine fentanyl being spread around uh, the Fort Bragg area well same as it is all over you know the United States regrettably this is a n- nightmare drug fentanyl it's killing people right and left I don't think any soldiers at Fort Bragg are going out trying to buy fentanyl specifically. Um, I think that the military has not done a, a, an adequate job of uh, um, warning soldiers that this can happen. Like you, you think you may be buying an oxy pill off the dark web. You think you may be getting a tab of LSD from your buddy. Um, but anything can contain fentanyl. It's, it's not the same as it was when, uh, when, when I was, you know, young enough to be going to parties where you could observe, you know, drugs and stuff like it, it's, it's the stakes are higher. Now the stakes are a lot higher. You can die from the first time you ever try something. So, you know, I hate to be such a s- square old buddy, duddy, but kids don't take drugs, <laughs> you know, I was talking, <laughs> not worth the risk. I was speaking with somebody today who's actually telling me about a friend of his, who's a first Sergeant in the 82nd airborne, um, died in 2020 and the day he got promoted to first sergeant, I guess he was out at a party, decided to like blow a line of coke, and it was laced with fentanyl, and he died. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, yeah, I've talked to a couple of moms uh, who, who whose sons same similar things happened to them. Um, you know, at Fort Bragg, um, and it, it's not just at Fort Bragg; it's everywhere. But I think we see the most of it at Fort Bragg for all sorts of different reasons. Um, one of them is that it's the biggest base. It's all infantry guys who are probably more, um, inclined to take risks and et cetera. And also more exposed to trauma, um, what have you. Um, it's also this, the home of these special operations unit at Green Berets. Also, once again, you have much more, uh, type, uh, a alpha, um, uh, aggressive type dudes that are, uh, that are drawn to that type of work. Same sort of psychological profile, I think, uh, of people that are inclined towards uh, heavy drinking, drug use, and the need for stimulation, whether it's, um, you know, jumping out of planes in service of your country, or whether it's, you know, going over the dark side um, uh, and doing some of this stuff that some people have been accused of allegedly trafficking drugs and, and, and young girls at, at Fort Bragg recently. Let's uh, let's get into that a little bit and, and um, talk about, you know, a lot of the things that you've been talking about and working on for the last couple of years. I feel like some of it is boiled over just in the last you know four weeks. Um, you know, if we're going to start off with uh, Christopher Lunny, Lunny, or I'm sorry, if we can start off with Christopher Looney, mm-hmm. you, uh, you showed me some of his records that you pulled. Um, mm-hmm. What can you tell us about this this soldier? Uh, Christopher Looney, um, I actually don't, I think you probably know more about him than, than I do. You had indicated that, uh, he worked as a bouncer at, um, O'Donnell's, um, in Southern Pines. I know that he was a Green Beret and third group. I know he was a relatively young guy, 28 or so. Uh, I know that he was charged in Cumberland County for, uh, for statutory rape and for trafficking a minor, which is really bad. That's not... I mean, that's that was some pretty serious charges, and um, I don't know what the circumstances behind that arrest are. The the, the uh, Cumberland County Sheriff's Office quite appropriately protects the identity of minor victims. They're not going to tell you anything about that. 
uh, or how that case came about until his trial, which won't be for a while. Um, his but his bond is 2.8 million, I think. Yeah. He may be sitting in the, in the hole for a while, yeah, unless his folks are independently wealthy, but that's what happens when, you know, that's what happens when you, you know, have sex with children, excuse me for being so blunt about it, but yeah. that's a, excuse me, that's a red line. Yeah. This you don't want to cross. You know, uh, some of the sources I spoke to over the weekend said that, yeah, he was moonlighting as a bouncer at a, at a special forces bar, you know, in Southern Pines uh, called O'Donnell's that like anybody mm -hmm. who's ever been down there has been to it. And <laughs> yeah. um, they said uh, at, at a certain point he started, uh, he was into really young girls, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old girls and started trafficking them and started trafficking them to other military members, other members of the special forces community. And, you know, yeah, the, the arrest record that, that you shared with me the other day, I mean, like you said, human trafficking, kidnapping, statutory rape. I haven't been able to confirm specifically that it was Looney's um, uh, case or cell phone that led to this, but my source wasn't able to confirm that directly, but they did say that, it was a rape allegation victim's phone comes out all of a sudden there's text messages between her uh and maybe group text messages involving other soldiers all referring to drug use drug sales drug distribution on fort bragg and so that's when cid starts to to, to really ramp up that, the high make, gear. that makes perfect sense now yeah and i'm told that uh major general chris or excuse me lieutenant general chris donahue was really angry <laughs> at this uh, at CID at the new, um, CID team leads, because, you know, there's been a lot of change at the top of CID due to their totally unsatisfactory performance mm -hmm. in 2020 and 2021. Um, they put in a new civilian, they oh, fired major because Jones. of Vanessa Guillen and Fort hood and everything that, that led to congressional and, investigations. And Fort Bragg, I think played a role into that as well. That weight in the balance firing Donna general Donna Martin, I think was, was a previous commander. They put in a new civilian commander, which is a, is a change in the structure of it. So now CID uh, is led by a civilian director, director, Special Agent Gregory Ford is his name. And so um, I think that I would imagine, and I hear um, secondhand that there's a real tension now between these two uh, leaders, uh, civilian and military, um, you know, who obviously Chris, Chris Donahue, ex-Delta guy, I'm told. Uh, who, who uh, you know, is just mob deep with all the soft units. He doesn't like that this is coming out. And SOCOM is having to put out these statements and, you know, that he wasn't known. He didn't know in advance that this is going to happen. He's pissed about that. But, you know, CID is going to say, of course, you don't know in advance. Yeah. You know, we have the prerogative. Yeah. You know, another thing, Jack, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, let me, how can I put this? CID can be surprisingly aggressive um, and they have undercover uh, agents in a lot of units. That's all I'll say about that. But, you know, I, I was going to mention about the, about Looney and the sex, uh, the child sex stuff, R whether it was him or not. And this is all allegedly, by the way, because we're just reporters trying to do our job and figure out what's going on based on a limited amount of information that the police have put out these people who are innocent or proven guilty. Um, and they haven't been found guilty yet, but you know, a, apart from his case, there have been a lot of similar cases where you just, after you get over your sort of disgust at the allegations, you have to kind of scratch your head and like wonder how is so much of this stuff going on in Fort Bragg. So I'm just looking at my files here. We've got, um, you know, 20, started just starting in 2021, you have this uh, Fort Bragg soldier gets 12.5 years in the stage kidnapping of a 12 year old girl. So James Murdoch Fletcher Peel, he pleaded guilty um, to kidnapping a 12 year old girl and got a bunch of time in prison. He was a Fort Bragg soldier. Um, then there was a, that same year, uh, Private Damien Isaiah Campbell, three counts of statutory rape, uh, five counts of statutory sex offense with a child, blah, 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 just goes on and on. Then there was the Joshua Glardon case. I don't know if you remember that one, but he was the um, first sergeant, or excuse me, the master sergeant in um, the PSYOPs unit at Bragg. 
uh, who, who had 15 counts of sexual exploitation of a minor, uh, a bunch of other charges. That one, Glarda, and those, that case is really gnarly. Uh, if you want to look into the details, they're just really awful. Um, then we had Gary Goins, 2022, um, who was with the, uh, what is it, the military, the security assistance training company at Fort Bragg, who raped, uh, or allegedly raped uh, a girl between the ages of 12 and 15. Um, and then now we got, you know, the, the Looney case. So th that's just, uh, that's, uh, five cases just off the top of my head, that, you know, um, that, uh, in the past two years at Fort Bragg, you got to wonder wh what's going on here. What's going on here, guys. What, what's with the, like drugs is one thing. This, this seems to be almost worse, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's terrible. At least I feel it's terrible and no, I don't want to, like it, it certainly brings me no joy to like point at special forces or Delta and be like, Hey man, like there's a pretty big problem in the ranks here, but like we can't keep ignoring this and, and let it just get worse and worse. Right. Like something, something's got to be said. And, you know, it, it's kind of um, sad when military leaders won't stand up, like they should be the ones that are, you know, pointing to the problem and saying, fix this, not like some dude like me or you. Right. Um, but you know, here we are, it seems like these problems are just allowed to fester. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, the secrecy of soft units is a double-edged sword because the, the, their prerogative to, to do covert operations attracts the interests of like investigative reporters like myself, like, Oh, you're a secret unit. Okay. Well, that makes me want to know every, every turnover, every stone and find out every bad thing you've ever done. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, but, and I think there's also the case that I think it's also the case that it's weird kind of contradictory, um, paradoxical situation you find yourself in when you're operating one of these units and they, you know, on the one hand you have this incredible privileges, uh, that no one else in the army gets like you get to go into work anytime you want. I will not even go through the long list, but when you work in the building, it is a completely different um, proposition than working anywhere else in the army, including the amount of money that you get paid. On the other hand, you're constantly on thin ice um, and you can, you can get booted from the unit for any reason. Um, so, but like to take the case of a guy like Levine, uh, the, it, it, after he kills Mark Leshiker, although it gets completely covered up and he doesn't get prosecuted, he's off the team like immediately, like he's never going to deploy again after that. Um, and you can just get a DUI and that's, that'll be the case. You'll never deploy with Delta again. You're it's over. Your career is over. So one small mistake can be the end of your career at that unit. But at the same time, like the unit's just, in, just interested in protecting its own reputation. It doesn't actually care. I think what happens to operators after they get out. Um, and that's why, you know, among other issues, you also see a lot of suicide of members of former members, you know, members. And so, you know, when those guys were questioned, the 15 soldiers were questioned on uh, Thursday, and then that led to on Sunday, um, first battalion of third special forces group did hundred percent recall. Uh, so, you know, everyone had to submit to a urinalysis for a drug test. Yeah. And I, I've been told that today, actually, as we're doing this interview, Tuesday, January 10th, uh, 3rd Battalion of 3rd Special Forces Group was recalled for 100%, um, you know, piss test formation as well. So, I mean, what do you, I mean, I was wondering if you had any insight into, you know, 3rd Group then and, and what's kind of happening there. And, you know, if you have any insight into sort of like the subculture, if you will, you know, I'm speaking of cr criminal activity, not, you know, guys yeah. doing their job. I don't have any, uh, super special insight into the group, except that there was one case involving two guys who, uh, trafficked cocaine from Columbia to the United States were third group soldiers. Uh, Daniel Gould was one of them. And the other guy was Henry Royer. And they were both, um, E sevens, if I'm not mistaken. And I've been in, in touch with both of those guys who are now in prison. Uh, I've, I've written letters and, and spoken to both of them by the phone, by phone. And also the guy who, um, who busted them, his name, the reserve captain named Steven Murga. But, um, G Gould, uh, was, is a really interesting character because he was a legit war hero. He was an SF team leader. 
um, and, and who, who won a silver star for heroism in Afghanistan, um, did uh, some incredible feats of valor over there that just made him a legend. And apparently talking to his former uh, teammates, you know, it's kind of like we were talking about before, this kind of can go to your head. Not only are you sort of traumatized by, by serving in, in, in war, you know, God knows where in Afghanistan, um, you know, supposedly just in this one incident, he killed like 12 of the enemy. So he's got all of that, um, you know, darkness and blowback on him to begin with. But then at the same time, like this sort of, uh, both counterbalancing and, uh, exacerbating effect of all the adulation and praise that he receives from his, from his team and from everyone who knows him thinks he's a hero. And then he gets sent to Columbia. He's by, operating by himself. Apparently he said he was in Cali by himself. I don't know how that works. Maybe you have some insight into how a third group Green Beret uh, assigned to SOCOM can be just by himself and what exactly he might be doing there. I don't know. He didn't go into that. But he did say that very easy under those circumstances for him to find cocaine. He denied that he did it for money. He said he did it for excitement, kind of what we were talking about a moment ago, like the psychology of it. He wanted to do something that was a real challenge. They can give him that same thrill that he used to get um, from combat, I suppose. And so, you know, he got 40 kilos of Coke packed into a punching bag, had this whole conspiracy with, uh, Henry Royer, um, who was another, uh, green beret who, who was back at Fort Bragg. They loaded, had it loaded up, uh, onto a C-130. It was at the airfield up there in Bogota. However, they made a big mistake because, uh, Gould, um, enlisted, uh, this, army reserve captain named Steven Murga into his scheme unwittingly. He told Murga here, drive this car onto the airfield and give them this punching bag to put on this flight. And Murga did that was going to do it because, um, apparently he did that routinely. That was something this logistically that made sense for these guys. Um, however, Gould told him, Murga mentioned, Hey, I'm about to swing by the embassy on my way to the airfield. And Gould freaked out and was like, no, 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 don't go to the embassy. Don't go to the embassy. <laughs> and so, cause of course the embassy is a, just a DEA station and CIA, I assume. But, uh, that made Murga very suspicious as you might imagine. And he basically concluded immediately that the punching bag was full of Coke. He didn't even have to open it just knowing Dan, he said that that was exactly the sort of thing Dan would do. So he goes to the DEA, uh, agent there on duty and some sort of comedic scenes ensue as he tries to convince them unsuccessfully that he's got a, a punching bag full of cocaine. None of them want to believe it. They don't believe it. They won't look into it. They go to lunch. He's sitting, <laughs> he's sitting there in the parking lot trying to get some DEA agent to take the story seriously. Finally, the actual director of the station walks by and it's like, who's this guy standing here? Uh, and they finally put the thing through an x-ray machine. Yeah, it's packed with Coke. And then uh, Gould, to his credit, just immediately turned himself in. Um, so, to, and then, uh, but, uh, lawyer, I think had to get stung, uh, in an op, but he also went down. So both of them went to prison for it. So that's a pretty sensational case of drug trafficking right there in third group. You were talking about 40 kilos of cocaine. That's not anything to sneeze at. I'm not sure what the street value of that is. Um, but there's this one drug caper for you. Um, and who knows how many others, you know, have been successful. If you're looking to make a career change or still trying to find your path outside the military, I recommend checking out Sabio, the coding bootcamp and developer community that's helped so many veterans become successful software engineers. Sabio teaches you the skills to start a real high paying tech job in just 17 weeks online and from the comfort of your own home. Visit Sabio.la slash military to learn how you can use your VA benefits to enroll. That's Sabio.la slash military. Yeah, in, including in this recent um, dust up with uh, Christopher Looney and um these these guys who are questioned uh one of the persons questioned i'm not going to say his name here but he was known by the special forces community to be their dealer for coke 
uh, fentanyl, mm-hmm. fentanyl, lollipops, ecstasy, and and roofies, and, and other you know other party drugs. Um, so th- th- it's an ongoing problem. Um, no doubt. And I, I mean, I think it's amazing that you've you know been able to chronicle some of these like different, like individually they're just little anecdotes, but they add up to this like bigger picture of you know again that we have a problem. And um, I know that you're uh, you're working on a book now, and I, I hope all of these stories appear in it. Um, could you tell us about you know what what your book's about, the direction you're taking, your research for it? Yeah, that's the idea um, it, that that all of this should go in, into the book, and that it should uh, cumulatively all these anecdotes come uh, paint a picture. Um, the book really traces the uh, Levine case from from beginning to end. Uh, starting with um, you know the, the murder of Mark Leshiger, uh and continuing through because it wasn't just that you know Levine did a lot of stuff after he killed Mark Leshiger. Um He was arrested many times after that, he, six times if I'm not mistaken, including one incident for um, firing shots at a guy just in the streets of Fayetteville. He was shooting at someone like in the streets uh, on Inlow Street, to be exact. Every single time, uh, the police just let him go, catch and release every single time. So. And then he turns up murdered under these very mysterious circumstances. And wouldn't you know it, the FBI is completely stumped. They don't know. So there's a lot of fodder there to explore. And um, it, the story but the story branches off in many different directions. Um, and what they all have in common is instances of criminality in elite units, particularly drug trafficking, uh, most of it uh, centered on Fort Bragg and in the uh, third group, seventh group, and in Delta, of course, because you know we've heard a, a lot of stories about Navy SEALs acting dumb, doing dumb stuff, uh, doing you know, worse than dumb stuff, you know, Eddie Gallagher case, of course. Um, and it, it seems that to me that uh, in some ways I'm tempted to suspect that, you know, because Naval Special Warfare is kind of the is kind of the uh, the lesser sibling, I guess, of JSOC or, or of the special operations world in general, SOC in general. It's almost like the, the, the they're the ones, the sort of sacrificial lambs who always get exposed. Like every time they do something dumb, it comes to light. But the pattern I see again and again with the army, man, is that this stuff just disappears. Like you, you, you can find traces of it, like in news archives, you can find police reports, you can dig stuff up through FOIA. Um, but it's usually there's a glimpse of something on the surface and then it just goes away and you never hear about it again. There was a case I was just looking at in 2019, just one blurb in the Fayetteville Observer just mentioned that a USASOC soldier had held his family hostage in Fayetteville uh, and the whole neighborhood had to be evacuated. Police forces from three different nearby towns were called to the scene to, as backup. Thank God the situation was de-escalated. Nobody was harmed. But you know what? It's such a funny thing. Even though this was only uh, two and a half years ago, no one at USASOC can remember that, what happened there. The PAOs can't remember a thing. Fayetteville uh, put PD. You, you, I foiled, FOIA'd their records. They don't say the name of the suspect on it. They have zero information. I've never seen a blank police incident report before, but it's virtually blank. Harnett County, same story. It's all blank. Um, they're just really minimal information, like the minimum that a police report would have to have on it to be a, a report, but none of them name the suspect and none of them will say anything about it. So it's my view that especially, uh, it, around Fort Bragg, that law enforcement is implicit in a sort of implicit conspiracy with use of SOC and with the, uh, base to um, at least when the offender or suspect is a member of Delta. That's, I think that's really the bright line distinction. If it's a Delta guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it goes back to what we were saying initially that there um, there's a lot of like broad strokes sort of reporting about the military, but not a lot about what happens in these homes in Fayetteville, you know, at the end of the day um, when the lights Mm -hmm. go off. And um, I'm going to probably upset somebody in saying this, but there, uh, you know, some of the publications out there that cover the military, they build equities with these commands that they don't want to burn. And Mm -hmm. so they can become reluctant for a report on some of this stuff that it it is embarrassing the commands. 
Um, but I mean, it also needs to be talked about. I mean, as you point out, just because you're a soldier is a part of a, a certain, uh, you know, elite unit, they shouldn't get a free pass to things, you know, child abuse and human trafficking and, and all this terrible, terrible stuff. Well, I, I was going to say, and, and I think that that's true, but I also understand that, like, let's just say you are the Fayetteville Observer or a reporter for that paper. Um, I kind of understand why they they can't take – that's a very small uh, institution with a very small budget compared yeah. to, like, JSOC or USASOC, who are some, some of the most powerful institutions in the whole U.S. government. And, and how many reporters uh, do they really have to send out to investigate the vast numbers of incidents that we're right. detailing here, right? They probably only have, right. what, five reporters that can beat, you know, beat the pavement? Yeah, I mean, they got Rachel Riley and F.T. Norton are the two got, are the two reporters who consistently report the stuff, and they're just not in a position to be going scorched earth against USASOC. That just wouldn't fly in Fayetteville. I, I kind of have the advantage of being a reporter from out of town from a national publication, so I can just parachute in uh, and, like you say, you know, sort of burn those bridges. Um, but I totally get that, that some people can, but. Yeah. But I, I would put put the most fault on some of our leading publications in the United States, uh, some of our so-called newspapers of record um, that f- for some reason just don't see these issues. It's, this just, just doesn't exist to them. I mean, the, pay, the piece you wrote yesterday for Odyssey, that could have been on the uh, – you didn't name anyone, so it was a bit preliminary. Um, but that could have been on the front page of the New York Times as far as I'm concerned. Uh, an investigation of that scale without such serious implications. And yet, you know, I just got done reading the entire New York Times archive of of, of stories that mention Delta Force. Uh, so I, I I have access to the archives and for my book. I wanted to see, I, I read literally every story that has ever been published in the New York Times that mentions Delta Force. And there's just nothing critical at all, except with one exception, which is a story by Dave Phillips last year. Um, the same is true uh, broadly of the Washington Post, and I don't quite get why that is because the, these are the same publications that will um, that will expose wrongdoing uh, in the SEAL community and the naval special warfare community. But for some reason, they just have a big blind spot around Fort Bragg and JSOC uh, in particular. Well, I, I think there's two two issues there, uh, two separate issues. You know, the first is that. My experience with, you know, my interactions with uh, some of these larger media outlets and like you brought up David Phillips, who's a terrific reporter and, you know, I really really enjoy his work. Um, But Mm -hmm. these these bigger papers, um, my experience with them and speaking to some of those folks is that they talk to like basically they talk to like National Security Council people. Um, directors and deputy directors of of different intelligence agencies, they're not going down to Fort Bragg and talking to like NCOs. Like, like I don't think they would. Even, some of them would not lower themselves and stoop to the level of talking to some E six or E seven uh, in a soft unit. They want to interview colonels and generals in the Washington DC area. And that's why their reporting has a certain type of tone to it. Mm-hmm. Whereas, mm-hmm. you know, your your articles that you've written are, are a bit different. Um, and, and then the second thing about the SEALs versus the Army is I think the, the SEALs really went out and deliberately cultivated this sort of public persona for themselves, and the Navy encouraged that. Um, as um, Ben Milligan's book, uh, it's a history book about naval special warfare, and, and uh, he points out that the SEALs um, in, in this capability – is a big deal for the Navy because it's their only ground warfare element. And it's mm-hmm. a way for the Navy to get their foot in the door in any sort of land-based conflict where they mm-hmm. wouldn't have had it previously. So mm-hmm. the SEALs are a big deal to the Navy overall and, and to be like the front men for the Navy and lead recruiting and everything else. Mm-hmm. And um, that definitely in the during the war on terror got out of hands out of their hands uh with the, mm-hmm. the um, what was it the act of valor movie that they made with active duty seals and then i mean you guys know the story right everyone knows like how how this got ratcheted up further and further to the point that you have dev group guys signing out their guns and night vision from the armory and doing demonstration jumps for the call of duty video game or, or the medal of <laughs> honor video game right so it got completely nuts um, and mm-hmm. all of that brought with it media fanfare, right? It brought with it um, mm-hmm. journalists looking at, you know, what's going on behind the curtain, like Matthew Cole's book, uh, Code Over mm-hmm. uh, 
uh, or David. Highly recommend David Phillips book. Also, uh, Alpha. Also a great book. Yeah, two uh, great books. It it, it, it kind of brought that attention of investigative journalists, and um, but that has not been quite the same with with um, Fort Bragg and and with perhaps special forces. Um, and c- certainly JSOC has an extra level of secrecy around it that just makes it even more difficult to penetrate. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm hoping to fill that gap with the with the book I'm currently working on. Um, I think you made a really good point about, um, you know, the, our, our most prestigious national newspapers and the people that they are interested in talking to and not interested in talking yeah. to. And I think that really basically fully encapsulates the problem. The New York Times published an article when Levine died um, it's the only article they published about Fort Bragg, uh, in the last few years. And they say specifically in that article that while Fort Hood has had this terrible year with all these violent incidents over there, things at Fort Bragg have been relatively calm with just one murder. That was the almost the exact quote. <laughs> and you can just see him, uh, you can just see that this reporter, actually, I think there was three reporters, three bylines of famous national security reporters on that article. And you, you can just see that they're just transcribing what they're being told. And I can not only that, but I can actually, cause the, you, you know, as well as I do that PAOs typically don't lie. Um, yes. They will spin the truth. They will twist the truth. Uh, you can even say that they almost never, or virtually never lie. However, they do their, by their job is to put the most positive interpretation possible on the truth. So when they're telling the New York times, Oh, it's been a relatively quiet year. We've only had one murder. Well, that's only one case that has been determined to be a murder. You also you didn't mention there's like four or five cases where the soldier just was beheaded for some reason, uh, or was just found uh, shot in the back of a truck for some reason. So he's leaving cases like that out. He's also leaving out cases where a person who was murdered by a four bag soldier. Uh, it's the highest body count uh, for any U.S. military base in modern history that I'm able to ascertain. Um, and even with that being the case, New York times wrote this article basically stating that everything is calm. There's nothing to see here at Fort Bragg. And it's just because of what you said, they just get on the phone with these commanders who they trust and believe everything they say and don't realize that they're um, being led down the garden path. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I want to touch on that uh, last point there, you know, as, uh, hopefully, um, you know, I can start to wrap wrap this up because it's, it's such an enormous topic. We've gone another six hours, um, but you point out that the enormous number of um, deaths uh, on the Fort Bragg area, you've written about this in the past. Um, could, could you comment on like what those deaths are, um, what you think is happening there, what your research has shown? Primarily suicide. Sadly, um, we know we have a suicide crisis in, in the U.S. military, um, and it just keeps getting worse. That's been the case for the last 20 years. Um, I think that the the military does take the suicide thing pretty seriously. I think they're pretty shook at Fort Bragg about it. I think they're more worried about suicide, frankly, than any of this other stuff. I think that's what's most disturbing to commanders that sit around these big tables. Um is the number of their soldiers that are shooting themselves in the head. That's gotta be disturbing when you're seeing it like on a weekly basis or on a biweekly basis, let's say. Um, and I just don't know what they're going to do about that. Um, the other leading cause of death is overdoses, drug overdoses. I think that's a a approximately number two. It's hard to determine because, um, uh, overdoses can be hard to distinguish from suicide in a lot of cases. Yeah but um it, it's up there it's up there you know you're talking about uh, dozens of deaths in in recent uh, few years and um then you you have typical accidents and illnesses really nothing you can do about some of those uh well of course accidents that everyone's about preventing that in the, in the military but that's a little bit separate it's kind of like a constant base level you are going to have people to die in training you are going to have people to get sick and die but what's really skewing the numbers are the suicides and the overdoses. Mm -hmm. Um, And then on top of all of that, while it's not statistically significant being like a major cause of death, you do have an alarming number of of, uh, homicides, you know, and people will say, well, 
Oh, it's the biggest army base, 50,000 guys. But if you have a town of 50,000 people, you're not having that number of murders by any means, not even close. Yeah. No, not even close. So it's a, it's a pretty toxic stew of, 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 uh, of, of, of situations that were, that were seen down there right at the moment. Um, and I don't know where it all ends. So take us back to the, the, the book for a moment. You said it's going to chart the course of, uh, Billy Levine's death, starting with Lesha Carr's death. And I mean, I, I know maybe you want to keep some, you play your cards close to your chest, but I mean, what, what do you see as being kind of the broad theme or some of the directions that maybe, um, this is going to go in for you? Well, I think we've touched on a lot of it so mm-hmm. far. I think we've, I think we've, people have kind of gotten a, I think it's a kind of an end of an era work in some ways, kind of a post GWAT, uh, life in Fort Bragg, you know, after the, after the fall of Kabul, because that happened right in the middle of all this. Interestingly, right in the few months after the 82nd evacuated the Kabul airport, um, that's when I saw the most number of deaths at Fort Bragg. Um, and I don't think that's a coincidence, um, because that was just such a, uh, a totally demoralizing, uh, and depressing end of, for, for 20 years of, of effort in Afghanistan. A lot of people who have given their lives in Afghanistan, a lot of people whose lives will never be the same as a result of their service over there. And you wonder, you know, the, the, the zero, uh, accountability from anyone in any kind of political position about how this is possible, the most powerful nation in the world that we spent a trillion dollars and couldn't beat the Taliban. They're, they're guys that just have, you know, bolt action rifles in some cases, um, or in any event, just, just AKs, uh, barely out of the stone age, uh, in, in a lot of senses. And yet uh, we're not able to defeat them in 20 years of war. Um, so many missed opportunities to, um, to have a negotiated end to that war. Um, with so many missed opportunities to, um, withdraw in a way that could have been, I don't know, credible or defensible ends to, to, to us objectives there. And just none of that, it was just mismanaged from beginning, uh, to the end. Um, and it, Every, and nothing happens though. There's no accountability for anyone in, in a real position of power for that. Mm-hmm. Um, from, from Bush to Biden, and I'm not leaving anybody out of, of uh, blame in that equation. They all, all of our presidents, Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden, they all did a poor job of managing the Afghanistan war. And it, in the end, it was all for nothing because the Taliban runs that country now. They're in charge and they have applied Sharia law Okay. But once again in 2022, so that's a, that's a hard, uh, thing to swallow. If, if you're a guy, a career soldier, um, yeah. who, who, who say you, you say you gave 10 years of your life to third group or you gave 10 years of your life to Delta and did, you know, uh, did a half dozen or a dozen deployments. That's not an easy thing to, 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 to sit with psychologically, I think like this big void in their life that is just there. Like what, what was that? What did it mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, yeah. We've got a lot of talking to do, a lot of hashing out to do over that war. And it's interesting. Uh, probably the best book on this has nothing to do with America, but it was actually, uh, the Russian war in Afghanistan because they, similarly got defeated, even though they're vastly more powerful than the Taliban, or excuse me, the Afghan government at the time wasn't the Taliban. Um, even though they're much more powerful and our neighboring country, in fact, have a border with Afghanistan, should have been able to just crush, uh, you know, these goat herders and village dwellers, which is what they thought, same as kind of we had in our minds. And yet they were defeated. They left with their tail between their legs. And a great book on that is called uh, Boys in Zinc by Svetlana Alexievich. Interesting. Um, kind of a weird title. Zinc is, they used to have coffins made out of zinc. So that's why it's called Boys in Zinc. Oh. It's got boys coming back from the, from the war. But it is a fantastic book. I think there's many parallels. And uh, I don't know, if someone listening to this podcast is kind of struggling with what we're talking about, um, yeah, I highly recommend that book as, as a place to start. Yeah, man, these are definitely some difficult topics, but 
you know the the problem doesn't get better by not talking about it like we've we've mm-hmm. tried that we've tried that route and that's kind of gotten us where we are right so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um we have to look at some other other options here. And uh, Seth, I really thank you for you know sharing some of your reporting with us uh, for this podcast. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it, this is all like difficult stuff, and it's going to take everyone some time to digest what we're talking about here. But I mean, I, I really believe it's it's critical for you know it, it affects everything from you know our soldiers and their families to national security and like literally everything in between. So it, it's it's an important mm-hmm. subject. Yeah, and I'm heartened to hear hear you say that because you know you're you're a um, uniquely credible voice in this community. Guys in the community will listen to you before they listen to anything I have to say. Um, Reluctant, so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that uh, we're on the right track. I hope. Yeah, me too. Um, Seth, where can people go to find you and find your work? Um, I, I mostly write for Rolling Stone, also for Harper's Magazine sometimes. Uh, at, the, at the moment, I, I'm on a sabbatical for this book. So um, just uh, find me on Twitter, follow me on Twitter. And um, anything I write will be posted there. So that's uh, at Seth Harp Esquire, that's Seth Harp ESQ. Um, anything that I, that I write, I'll post there. Awesome. So, Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, any final thoughts before we uh, wrap up? Um. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm sorry for cursing so much uh, <laughs> on this upstanding publications uh, podcast. I should have shown a little bit more respect. I hope you can <laughs> believe some of that. These two episodes have been maybe the most explosive interviews we've ever done, but in my opinion, they're needed. Fort Hood has rightly gotten a lot of attention from the public, the media, and even Congress, but Fort Bragg has a lot of its own problems as well. The numbers of soldier deaths in and around Bragg is shocking as it is concerning, and the entire issue needs to be subjected to further scrutiny. Seth is working on a book about this topic that I'm sure we'll hear more about in the near future. Until then, it's incumbent on reporters like Seth and myself to keep the pressure up and let people know that these issues exist in hopes that they can be reformed. Be sure to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter at StripesMMPod. And if you have a tip or story idea, shoot us an email at militarymatters.stripes.com. Don't forget, you can get 50% off your digital subscription to Stars and Stripes today. Just use promo code PODCAST and get 50% off your digital subscription. That's promo code PODCAST. This episode is brought to you by Sabio, the number one coding bootcamp for veterans. Visit sabio.la slash military to learn more. Thank you for listening. I'm Rod Rodriguez. I'm Jack Murphy. And we'll see you at the next episode.